Other presentation and in the other presentation i mentioned borley rectory harry price and some of the notable um, cases and luminaries from the past gnm tyrrell and um, sir oliver lodge morris gross guy lion playfair because i i've as it says in my bio i've been around the block a bit and um, one gets to a point where you just presume that everybody you're speaking to has a has a, a similar level of uh, background knowledge of these historical events. And so when we allude to them, um, people say, well, I, I don't really know much about Baldy. I saw the film and I've read some stuff in magazines and newspapers. So I thought um, with with CJ it would be worthwhile um, as old timers kind of having a background to um, and perhaps other, other talks going forward to give more of a background to these cases and people that we more than occasionally drop into our conversations and presentations. So tonight it is, um, it will, it will focus on both price and Borley and it won't go into huge depth but it will hopefully um, provide a level of background um, knowledge. You should all now see a book cover and not have to see me. Does that work? It does, yeah. Cool. Yep. Right. So I'm presuming that everybody can hear me. Somebody yes. say they can hear me. Yes. We can oh, hear you. Yes. Okay. Let's, let's be... Let us then commence. Borley Rectory may not actually be the most haunted house in England, um, but it is one of the most well-known and absolutely the most talked about location that's probably ever been um, documented. The site itself was actually known to be haunted long before the rectory was ever built and has continued to be a place up to the present day that is right at the very top of the bucket list for many ghost hunters to go visit. Um, although the building itself is now long gone, burnt down. Um, the ghosts and the, t uh, the stories have endured and perhaps even today, they still, if not the ghosts themselves, continue to haunt the site. The range of phenomena that have been experienced and reported at Morley Rectory and the nearby church includes almost every type of manifestation that we consider when we think about haunted houses. Apparitions, objects being thrown, doors mysteriously locking themselves, cold spots, strange lights, phantom carriages pulled by phantom horses, people being attacked writing appearing on the walls, footsteps in empty corridors and disembodied voices. Borley has them all. More than 10,000 separate incidents have been documented at the location over the past 100 years. For 20 of the most turbulent years, the rectory was investigated by Harry Price, arguably the world's greatest ghost hunter, certainly one of the world's most famous ghost hunters, who even went as far as to take a lease for an entire year on the property, putting it un under a round-the-clock observation by a trained team of investigators. The rectory, as I said, was destroyed by a fire in 1938, but to this date, the area surrounding the former rectory, together with its, the nearby church, still presents a challenge to modern generations of investigators. During 1862, whilst the Civil War raged across the United States, 
over this side of the Atlantic in a quiet and secluded hamlet of Borley in the county of Essex. A new rectory was being built by the Reverend Henry Dawson Ball to house his young and growing family. The house was reputedly built upon the site of a former convent, and although this was later disproved, it is certainly the case that an earlier rectory had existed on the site, but which had burnt down in 1841 under somewhat unusual circumstances. There were already stories of ghosts and ghostly sightings on the site circulating around the district for years before the rectory was built, tales of ghostly monks and of a phantom carriage being pulled by headless horses. Almost immediately upon its completion, the new rectory and the surrounding area began to gain an even spookier reputation for the numerous ghosts that haunted its rooms and hallways and walked and stood in the grounds. Those who visited or who worked at the rectory told tales of their unusual and sometimes terrifying experiences, and it was not uncommon for the maids or servants to suddenly leave their posts, refusing to return. The most common of the spectres that were said to haunt Borley was that of a silent, mournful apparition of a nun who stalked the gardens. The ghostly nun was often to be seen at twilight or dawn, gliding silently along, taking the same route through the garden over again, whilst at other times she would be observed standing motionless in the driveway, leaning on the gate and starting and staring mournfully out across the fields and the nearby church. But perhaps the nun is best known for her habit of staring in through the windows of Borley Rectory, silently watching the family as they sat down to eat. It is said that this particularly disconcerting action ultimately resulted in the Reverend Henry Ball actually bricking up the dining room window in order to preserve, prevent the phantom from disturbing the family and frightening his servants. So common were the nuns' appearances said to be that the Reverend Bull built a summer house in his garden where he would sit in the evenings and try to catch a glimpse of her, often spending hours sitting there alone waiting for her to appear. Another frequently reported phantom was that of a coach pulled by black horses, seen often after dark, speeding wildly up the lane towards the rectory before stopping outside the door and then vanishing. Several versions of this story circulated through the district, some of which described encounters where either the horses or the coachman, or sometimes both, were described as being headless. But though Borley was well known locally as a place where ghosts walk and where most of the folk living nearby took pains to avoid after dark, the first modern account of paranormal activity at the house actually dates from 1885. In the summer of that year, the respected scholar and author per Percy Shaw Jeffrey was staying at the rectory as a guest of the Bull family. Immediately following his visit, he reported witnessing stone throwing and other poltergeist-like activity during his stay at the rectory. He also stated that he had seen the nun on several occasions. During one of the visits, his French dictionary went missing. The following night, it was returned, flung back, seemingly out of thin air, landing on the floor in the middle of his bedroom. Following the death of the Reverend Henry Bull in 1892, the rectory passed to his son, the Reverend Harry Bull. In reality, Harry had been baptised as Henry Foister Bull, but was always known as Harry Bull to avoid confusion with his father, Henry. Harry lived his entire life with several of his sisters until his own death in, can I, 
bear with me, I can't actually see what I'm doing. So I'm just going to press a switch and make a light come on. There we go. Throughout his time at, as the rector of Borley, Harry also described many encounters of his own with the apparitions that haunted the rectory. Harry Bull also claimed to have seen the nun on numerous occasions, and like his father before, he would also spend many hours sitting in the summer house, waiting and watching for the nun to appear. Both father and son passed away in the same room on the first floor overlooking the garden, a room later known and referred to as the Blue Room. After the Reverend Harry Ball's death, Borley Rectory lay vacant. Ball's sisters decided to move away to live in a smaller, more comfortable property, and it seemed that nobody was in any hurry to become the new rector and move into this rambling old cold rectory. The building was large and poorly maintained. It lacked many amenities, including running water. It was cold in the winter, and of course, it had gained a fearsome reputation for being haunted. Eventually, after almost a year, a new rector was appointed, and Borley Rectory was again occupied. The new rector, sorry, the new rector uh, was the Reverend Guy Eric Smith. He was a cousin of the Bull family and had recently arrived in Britain from Canada with his wife Mabel. Shortly after the Smiths arrived at Borley in 1928, a small parcel wrapped in brown paper was discovered when cleaning out a cupboard. When the parcel was opened, it was found to contain a human skull probably belonging to a young woman. On Smith's orders, the skull was buried without any ceremony in the adjacent churchyard by Smith's gardener. Work. Oh, you vicious programme. Hang on. There you go. By the latter half of the 1920s, Harry Price was already established as Britain's foremost psychical researcher and ghost hunter. Price was an engineer and a highly skilled magician who, from an early age, had become interested in investigating claims of mediumship and ghostly encounters. In addition to investigating haunted houses, Price attended many spiritualist meetings and seances, although he was never very impressed by what he saw when attending these gatherings, recognising many things that the mediums were doing as nothing more than simple magic tricks and illusions. Among the many seances he attended, Harry witnessed a number of famous mediums of the day, Mrs Thomas Everett, who specialised in psychometry, Mr Charles Eldred, the materialist materialization medium who was later exposed by another investigator eldred was found to be using props that were hidden in the armchair that he used uh, to, used to take with him from seance to seance harry described eldred's performance as a cheap and nasty racket based upon credulity and a general longing for supernatural thrills Around this time, the author, the artist John Domain, painted a portrait of the 19 year old Harry Price. It was a portrait of an ambitious young man. Price later said in his biography that his ambitions as a 21 year old included owning a Rolls Royce, writing for the Encyclopedia Britannica, and appearing in Who's Who. Down the years, Harry Price has been criticised for being a supreme egotist. But in reality, is he really any different from the modern day ghost hunting celebrities? In his own autobiography, he shows an engaging honesty when he says, I feel I must have been very vain in my young days. To say the, the least of it, even now I am accused of being egotistical. It should be noted that all those ambitions that he had as a 21 year old he managed to achieve before his death 
Weiss was passionately interested in the paranormal and eventually joined the Society for Psychical Research, where he drew upon his expertise as a magician and a conjurer in order to demonstrate many of the tricks used by the false mediums. In 1923, together with a fellow SPR member, Dr. Eric Dingwall, he produced a facsimile copy of The Revelations of a Spiritual Medium. The original book had been written in 1892 by an unknown American medium, and it exposed many of the tricks used by the fraudulent mediums. The original now is long gone out of print, and it was always hard to find as most of the original copies had been bought up and destroyed years before by those who set out, by those who it set out to expose. Price managed to locate just two copies, one of which he sacrificed in order for a facsimile to be made. Price was also interested in the claims of spirit photographers, including Mr. William Hope, who had been producing supposed spirit phot photographs since 1905 and who had formed his own spiritualist circle in Crewe in order to promote himself and his spirit photography. Hope was considered to be one of the best spirit photographers in the world and had many followers, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. Together with investigators from the SPR, Price tested and exposed the crew circle and its leader, William Hope. During 1922, the investigators had carried out tests in which they had secretly used marked photographic plates, which showed that Hope was switching the photographic plates for ones which had been previously exposed and which contained the latent images of the spirits which only appeared once the plates were developed. The expose by Price was published by the SPR in its journal, and Harry also produced his own book detailing the photographic and other fraud that was being used by Hope and his circle, entitled Cold Light on Spiritualist Phenomena. The techniques used by Hope were also commonly being employed by many other spirit photographers on both sides of the Atlantic. You may be forgiven for thinking that Price was highly sceptical of mediumship and psychical phenomena. It is true that he was openly critical of, of those mediums who he considered acting fraudulently. But this idea that he was sceptical is far from the truth. Price was also not afraid to champion those whose powers he considered to be genuine, or at least without explanation. In response to a 1923 article in the London magazine in which the famous magician Neville Maskelyne attacked both spiritualism and anyone who believed in the possibility of supernormal phenomena, Price wrote an open letter of several thousand words, arguing strongly for his belief that some phenomena were genuine. He cited Sir Oliver Lodge, Sir William Barrett and Professor Charles Richet who as eminent scientists were all engaged in psychical research. Price concluded by writing, I was a great skeptic as yourself, Mr. Maskelyne, before I took the trouble to investigate honestly the subject. Continuing to poke fun at his fellow magician, Price then asked if Maskelyne was afraid of genuine phenomena competing with the glue and canvas imitations. This battle between Price and Maskelyne continued for many years. And in another open letter to Maskelyne, published in the Times newspaper, Price challenged the great magician to produce phenomena equal to those that he had observed being produced by mediums under identical controlled conditions. The letter, Dear Maskelyne, Price wrote, Can you lower the temperature? of a sealed room containing 15 people by 12 degrees in an hour? Can you make my handkerchief dance around at the base of a bright red electric lamp like it was a moth dancing around a candle? Could you materialize a half-formed hand and an arm beneath the same lamp with the medium controlled as in a vice? It would also be wrong to believe that Harry liked or even admired spiritualism. 
He could not accept spiritualism should be a religion and insisted that psychical research must be considered as a new branch of science. He had clashed with mediums and spiritualists ever since he had begun his investigations. The music and, and had clashed with many musical mediums, fortune tellers and clairvoyants and phony spiritualists spiritual advisors who flourished the end of the Victorian and Edwardian era and who were joined enjoyed a heyday during and immediately following the Great War. But Harry also counted many sp spiritualists amongst his personal friends and amongst them was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, at that time considered one of the world's leading champions for the spiritualist movement. Price and Doyle had a very strange relationship alternating between admiration and hostility. For instance, following Price's exposure of Hope, William Hope, Conan Doyle fiercely argued with Price, extolling Hope as a genuine medium and vouched for the authenticity of Hope's spirit photographs. Later, when Price visited Germany in 1922 to witness some of the remarkable seance feats of the medium Willy Schneider and expressed his belief that these were genuine psychical phenomena that could not be explained by trickery or by self-deception. He was congratulated by Conan Doyle for his meticulous investigations. In 1925, Price established the National Laboratory for Psychical Research, his aim being the rigorous exploration and investigation of every aspect of the paranormal, from mediumship to haunted houses. The NLPR was equipped with a seance room, a fully equipped lab and a fully equipped laboratory. Price hoped that the work of the NLPR would pave the way towards an academic acceptance for psychical research. To this end, Price designed numerous ingenious devices and apparatus in order to test the medium's abilities. One of these was an ingenious double table consisting of an outer and an inner portion. The inner table had a shelf almost the same size as the top. And this shelf was surrounded on all sides by a mesh, metal mesh gauze, so that the only access to the enclosed space was through a trap door at the top of the table, which could be opened easily from within but could not be opened from the outside without using a special device. A selection of musical instruments was then placed in the protected shelf and thus sealed off. It should therefore have been practically impossible to play any of these instruments by normal means. However, a mouth organ and an auto harp were played several times during different sittings, often accompanied by flashes of light crackling noises and blue lights in the vicinity of the medium the table as you can see was ultimately de destroyed smashed to matchwood during a seance held whilst testing the medium stella cranshaw better known as stella c a further device called the shadow apparatus consisted of a battery and lamp in a metal box with a telephoto camera lens used as a projector and a red filter, which directed a pencil beam of light onto a luminous screen. This was used to reveal the shape of whatever manipulated the bell or trumpet within the double table. When the light on this apparatus was switched on, the shadow of whatever was moving the objects could be seen clearly on the screen. One of the results of this experiment was, re was really quite remarkable. Fellow researcher Eric Dingwall later described this experiment. I quote, When the red light was switched on underneath the table, I lay down on the floor and looked through the passage towards the luminous screen. From near the medium's foot, which was invisible, I saw an egg-shaped body beginning to crawl towards the centre of the floor underneath the table. It was it was white and where the light was reflected, it appeared opal. 
to the end nearest the medium was attached a thin white neck like a piece of macaroni it advanced towards the center and then rapidly withdrew back into the shadows together with other members of the nlpr price continued to investigate haunted houses poltergeists and other paranormal claims for example in 1928 he investigated a poltergeist outbreak in the london suburb of battersea the house was home to 86 year old henry robinson his son and his three daughters in addition to the family there was also mrs perkins and her son just before the christmas of 1927 price learned of strange happenings at the house but it wasn't until the middle of january 1928 when he was able to visit he found a scene of utter destruction broken windows smashed furniture and shattered ornaments price learned that the events had begun in november with lumps of coal and pennies being continually thrown at the conservatory to the rear and breaking all of the glass as the events continued and intensified, the police were called, the family believing that someone was throwing the missiles over the garden wall. A constable arrived, and as he stood, coal and pennies began to rain down upon him, some of them hitting his helmet. He rushed to look over the garden wall, but there was nobody there. In December, the, weather, the washerwoman, who worked for the family, found a pile of burning cinders in the outhouse. Terrified, she refused to work in the house any longer. The police were again summoned, and they took up position in the kitchen, watching over the open windows. As he stood, as the police officer stood, two large potatoes were hurled at him from the direction of the garden. Price continued his investigation and eventually reached the conclusion that the tenants, including a number of which, including a number of which uh, events he witnessed himself, were subject to some type of genuine phenomena. It was Tuesday, June the 11th, 1929, when Harry was lunching at a friend's house, when the maid called Harry to the telephone. The call was from the editor of the Daily Mirror, who said that his newspaper had been called upon by the Reverend Guy Smith, the present incumbent of Borley Parish, where extraordinary things were taking place. When Harry returned to his office, he read the report in the preceding day's newspaper by the reporter V.C. Wall. Ghostly figures of headless horsemen and a nun an old-time coach drawn by two bay horses, which appears and vanishes mysteriously, dragging footsteps in empty rooms. All these ingredients of a first-class ghost story are awaiting investigation by psychic experts. The scene of these ghostly visitations is the rectory at Borley, a few miles from Long Melford. It is a building erected on the part of a site of a great monastery, which in the Middle Ages was the scene of a gruesome tragedy. The present rector, the Reverend G. E. Smith, and his wife made the rectory their residence in the face of warnings by previous occupiers. Since their arrival, they have been puzzled and startled by peculiar happenings, which cannot be explained and which confirms the rumours that they heard before moving in. The first untoward happening was the sound of slow dragging footsteps across the floor of an unoccupied room. Then one night, the Reverend Smith, armed with a hockey stick, sat in the room and waited for the noise. Once again, it came. The sound of feet in some kind of slippers treading on the bare boards. Mr. Smith lashed out with his stick at the spot where the footsteps seemed to be, but the stick whistled through the empty air and the footsteps continued across the room. Then a servant girl brought from London suddenly gave notice after two days' work, declaring emphatically that she had seen a nun walking in the wood at the back of the house. Finally comes the remarkable story of an old-fashioned coach, 
seen twice on the lawn by a servant, which remained in sight long enough for the girl to distinguish the brown colour of the horses. This same servant also declares that she has seen a nun leaning over the, gal over the gate near the house. The villagers dread the neighbourhood. All of these visitations co coincide with the details of a tragedy, which, according to legend, occurred at a monastery which stood on the site of the rectory. A groom at the monastery had apparently fallen in love with a nun at the nearby convent, runs the legend, and they used to hold clandestine meetings in the wood on which the rectory now backs. Then one day, they arranged to elope, and another groom had a coach waiting on the road outside the wood in which they could effect their escape. Some say that the nun and her lover quarrelled and that he strangled her in the wood and that, and that he was caught and beheaded with, uh, with the other groom for his villainy. In another version, all three were caught in the act of fleeing and the groom was beheaded and the nun was interred alive inside the walls of the monastery. The previous owner of the rectory, now dead, often spoke of the remarkable experiences he had uh, one night while walking down the road outside of the rectory, hearing the clatter of hooves. He turned and looked around and he saw to his horror an old-fashioned coach lumbering toward him, drew by two headless men, driven by two headless men. With a photographer, I have just completed a vigil of several hours in the haunted wood at the back of Borley Rectory, although we saw only one of the manifestations which have, according to the residents, occurred frequently. In recent years, this by itself would be peculiar enough. It was the appearance of a mysterious light in a disused wing of the building, an appearance which simply cannot be explained because an investigation of the deserted wing quickly ascertained that there was no light inside. The following morning, together with his secretary, Miss Lucy Kay, Harry packed his ghost hunting kit and prepared for the drive up to Borley. Inside the ghost hunting kit, which was described by Harry in his biography, um, he contains, or he describes it containing some of the following articles. A pair of felt overshoes used for creeping unheard around the house in order that neither human beings nor paranormal entities should be disturbed whilst, whilst in the act of producing phenomena. A steel measuring tape for measuring rooms, passages, testing the thickness of walls when looking for secret chambers, steel screw eyes, lead post office seals, sealing tool, strong cord or tape and adhesive surgical tape for sealing doors and windows, a set of tools with wire and nails, a hank of electric flex, a small electric bell, batteries and switches for making electrical contacts, a reflex camera, packs of film and flash bulbs for indoor and outdoor photography, a small portable telephone for communicating with an assistant, a notebook, a red and black pencils, a sketching pad and drawing instruments for making plans, a first aid kit, a flask of brandy, a ball of string, sticks of chalk, uh, matches, electric torch and candles, a bowl of mercury for detecting tremors in rooms or passages, a cinematograph camera with a remote control and films. Goes on. A sensitive transmitting thermometer with charts to measure the slightest variation in temperature in supposed haunted rooms. And a pack of graphite and a soft brush for developing fingerprints. Price then added that for longer stays he might take with him infrared lamps and filters and cine film sensitive to infrared light so that he could take photographs in almost complete darkness. Periodically. He also used electric signalling instrument, which he invented, 
and which could automatically reveal to the investigator the movement of any object in any part of the house or any change in the temperature in any room. According to Price's notes, a mile or so outside of Sudbury on the Long Melford Road, we saw a signpost to Borley and in a few minutes we entered one of the drive gates leading to the rectory. Upon our arrival, we were greeted by the Reverend Smith and his wife and proceeded to hear the story of their experiences at first hand over lunch. It tallied with the printed account in the newspaper, but contained greater detail. The Smiths described hearing the slow, deliberate footsteps, the mysterious ringing of the servants' bells, despite the fact that the bell wires had been cut. They also described the apparitions seen by the road, by the maid servants, but most peculiar were the description of voices. The incoherent whispering seemed to echo and to follow the Reverend Smith around the rectory when he was alone. And on occasions he heard a woman's voice rise and cry out, don't, Carlos, don't, before dying away again. Price was also told the story about the bricked up window in the dining room. Following lunch and Price and his secretary began their detailed examination of the rectory. They proceeded floor by floor, beginning at the attic and the upper floors. They recorded detailed measurements in every room and closet in turn, closing and sealing windows and doors as they left. This meticulous procedure was then followed on the ground floor and also in the cellars. Price then interviewed Mary Pearson, the maid who had claimed to have seen the Phantom Coach on two occasions, and he also talked to members of the Bull family, including two of Henry Bull's sisters, and the sisters uh, sorry, two of Henry Bull's daughters, also the sisters of the Reverend Harry Bull. Henry Bull's son and the rectory's second incumbent following their father's death. After a full day of exploring and interviewing, around midnight, the assembled party, namely Price, his secretary, V.C. Wall, the reporter, two of the Bull sisters and the Reverend and Mrs. Smith proceeded to the Blue Room where they held a seance. A series of short raps were heard behind the wooden dresser. By establishing a code of one rap for no, three raps for yes, and two for an uncertain answer, Price established the identity of the spirit of the Reverend Henry at Harry Bull. A series of additional questions put to the spirit by the Bull sisters, who were sisters of the late rector, seem to confirm the identity of the communicant. This seance, la seance lasted for about three hours, and at some point a bar of soap was lifted from the washstand and thrown with considerable force against the sitters, whilst they remained some distance away. The following morning, Price returned to London, convinced that this was a, a case uh, that he should return to and to conduct a more thorough investigation. Over the coming weeks, Price visited Borley several more times, amassing more evidence about the strange events. Further interviews took place with the Smiths, with members of the Bull family and also villagers who added their own testaments and accounts of the strange and unusual goings on in and around the, the rectory, uh, the garden and the lane. More tales of phantom coaches being seen and heard, more accounts of apparitions, not only that of a nun, but an, an account of an old man, I, identified as being old Amos, a servant who had died years before. Price heard stories that Harry Bull had entered an old crypt beneath Borley Church and discovered coffins that had apparently been moved around. Also tales of lost treasure. The church silver seemingly being hidden centuries before by the Waldegrave family. 
Harry also listened as the Bull sisters told him about their, their brother, the Reverend Harry Bull, who, like his father before, would spend hours sitting in the summer house in the garden so that he might be able to observe the nun and to commune with the spirits. On one occasion, Price witnessed showers of small stones being thrown and later a shower of door keys, which seemed to have been removed from many of the internal doors. During another of the visits, Price found several Catholic medallions, which he was able to identify as being of French origin, including a St. Ignatius medal. Within a year, the Smiths had vacated the rectory, leaving it once more abandoned and empty. Some accounts say that it was the ghostly activity was so bad that they simply could not bear it any longer. Others, that it was merely due to the poor state of the building, which lacked any modern amenities. Nevertheless, Borley would lie empty for over a year un until a new incumbent, the Reverend Lionel Foister, arrived with his wife Marianne and their young daughter Adelaide in October 1930. In October 1931, after almost 18 months' absence, Harry returned to the rectory at the invitation of the new incumbent, the Reverend Lionel Foister. The Reverend Foister had sent Price a copy of a diary which he had been keeping since shortly after they had arrived the previous year. Upon reading it, Price immediately realised that things at the rectory were as bad as ever, if not considerably worse. Doors were found to be locked and the keys missing, trapping members of the family on occasion. The Reverend Foister had sometimes reported to using, resorted to using a holy medallion to help him open the doors. The diary also detailed accounts of phantasms, the appearance and disappearance of countless objects, both large and small, furniture being broken, and of several failed attempts at exorcism. Disembodied voices were heard calling to Foister's wife by name, Marianne. The phantom had continued unab unabashed by day and by night since their arrival. The diary also provided accounts of numerous witnesses to the phenomena, including Sir George and Lady Whitehouse, who were later interviewed by Price. Lady Whitehouse and her son, a Catholic priest, vouched for the diary's contents and added more of their own. Price once again made several visits to the rectory and eventually concluded that whilst a great deal of the phenomena were indeed likely to be paranormal, a large number also seemed to be the result of fraud, either intentional or otherwise by Marianne. He noticed, he, he voiced his opinions to the rector, who was far from impressed by this suggestion that his wife was implicated. And for a time, Price found himself persona non gratis and excluded from the site. Once again, he returned to his other investigations. Foister continued to keep his extensive diary. It contained accounts of bricks being thrown, footsteps and the apparitions of the nun, together with several ghostly appearances by the Reverend Harry Bull. Mysterious fires were started and both Foister and his wife were reported being attacked several times. The most mysterious phenomena of all was the appearance from, 19, from 1931 of writing on the walls. In 1920, 1932, the rectory was visited by the Mark K Psychic Circle, led by the medium Guy Lestrange. After witnessing many of the reported events for themselves, Lestrange carried out an exorcism which had first appeared to have been successful. However, this calm was not to last long, and soon the phenomena started up again with a vengeance. The attacks intensified. Marianne was increasingly the victim of this poltergeist. She claimed to have been physically attacked several times, pushed down the stairs. She would frequently flee from the rectory and spend nights at the home of nearby friends 
who themselves witnessed the events many times. Objects would rain down and frequently would appear to be deliberately aimed at people. Doors would continue, continue to lock themselves, leaving members of the family or the servants trapped. In desperation, Foister resorted to once more using a religious relic or religious medallion of the Cure da, which he had in the past sometimes found to be effective at causing the doors to unlock and release him or the trapped family member. In 1935, the Foisters left Borley, citing ill health, and throughout the following three years, Price kept in touch with events at the now empty rectory by letter. The new incumbent, the Reverend Albert Henning, lived with his wife at the nearby and decidedly more comfortable rectory at Liston after both parishes had been combined. The church authorities, meanwhile, decided to sell the abandoned rectory, but with no success. Reverend Henning approached Price with the suggestion that he might purchase it, but Price turned down his offer and instead negotiated a one-year lease on the property. Upon obtaining the lease, Price set about organising a team of investigators, placing an advert in the Times newspaper on May the 25th, 1937. The response to this advert was phenomenal. Over 200 applicant applications were received from cleaners to counts, cranks to inventors, mediums, journalists, all applied. Most price simply consigned to the waste bin. In the end, he selected about 40 people who he considered would be suitable to act as an investigation team over the coming year. One by one, Price met with the remaining applicants, and once he had satisfied himself that they were of the right character, he included them in the investigation. He got them to sign a declaration form which he had carefully prepared. As he said himself, as a legal document, it probably wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, but as a gentleman's agreement, it offered Price and the investigation some degree of protection, and throughout the entire investigation, there was never one single instance of it being violated or abused. For the first time in psychical research, there was now a printed book of instructions for the guidance of those investigating Borley, or indeed any other haunted location. The book had a cheap blue card cover and contained instructions for the investigated issued only to those who had signed the declaration it contained information about the location the phenomena that may be encountered and what steps the observers ought to take price included detailed instructions in his notes for the uh, observers that covered most of the eventualities that he considered important he also warned his observers to be aware that not everything was paranormal and particularly um, reference to the uh, manifestations caused by such things as small boys, villages, villagers, the wind, wood shrinking, death watch beetle or farm animals nosing the doors. That's something we encounter a lot today. Well, not small boys anyway. Price's investigation lasted a full year, and during that time, his team of, of observers documented hundreds of odd and unusual incident, incidents, including the ringing of the bells used to summon the servants, even though all of the bell wires had been cut, and the appearance of writings on the walls, which continued from the Foisters' uh, incumbency. Most peculiar of all, was a particular spot just outside of the blue room, the bedroom in which both the Reverend Henry and later his son Harry passed away. Marked with white paint by the investigators, this spot was considerably colder than its surroundings and Price made a series of detailed measurements of this area. At times it was 
found to be up to 11 degrees colder than the adjacent passageway areas. Sydney Glanville, Price's trusty deputy for this year-long investigation of Borley, experimented with the use of a planchette at several seances held at the rectory and also in his London home. By this means, Glanville claimed to have discovered the name of the ghostly nun, together with details suggesting that she may have been murdered. The spirit of the nun gave her name as Mary or Marie La or Lair. At another seance, the group made contact with a spirit called, which called itself Sunex Amores. The spirit said that it would start a fire over the entrance hall of the rectory and burn the building to the ground on the night of March the 27th, 1938, and that the bones of the murder victim would be revealed afterwards. The prophecy failed to come true, and Price gave up his one-year lease in May 1938. The rectory was sold shortly afterwards to Captain Gregson. However, on March the 27th, 1939, close to 9pm, and exactly 11 months after the prophecy, a fire started over the entrance hall when an oil lamp was knocked over by Captain Gregson. The building was gutted by fire. The fire may have de devastated the rectory, but it did not prevent the phenomena from continuing or investigators continuing to visit the site in the hopes of witnessing something for themselves of the strange goings on. Between 1939 and 1943, more than 20 investigations were conducted in the burnt out shell of the building. And they continued to report unusual phenomena, including the sound of horses' hooves and occasional sightings of the nun. In 1944, it was finally decided to demolish the building, and an excavation began in the cellars, which was overseen by Price. And it was during these excavations that part of a human skull and jaw were found. It was sent for analysis and determined to be that of a young female. Following analysis of the fragment, it was buried in the nearby church of Liston by the rector, A.C. Henning, and with Price in attendance. The site of the original burial, hang on, that should have changed. Ah. The site of the original burial is still actually apparent, although it is now obscured by a much more recent um, grave. Ultimately, Harry Price wrote two books detailing his investigation at great length. The Most Haunted House in England and The End of Borley Rectory. In addition, he also wrote numerous newspaper and magazine articles. He gave talks, lectures and a number of radio broadcasts about the rectory, which he called The Most Haunted House in England, a title that he had learned during his first visit. Meanwhile, back at Borley, the activity continued, although there was still occasional where there were still occasional reports of phenomena on this at the site of the demolished rectory, the majority of the paranormal activity and the focus of the investigators had now shifted across the road to the adjacent and ancient church. In the 1960s, a team of investigators were even joined by a BBC camera crew as they carried out their investigations at the church. In the early 1970s, one group of investigators spent several months at the church, armed with equipment that included tape recorders, and they ended up capturing some of the most extraordinary events, which they later described in a BBC radio interview. The following sound occurred ten minutes later, and it really sent shivers down our spines. It was the sort of effect one imagines haunted houses to produce. It originated just in front of the altar rail, and yet the floor there is of stone.
those were footsteps, it must have belonged to a very large and powerful man. Eight minutes later, there was another sound generated, but we have no idea what it represents. We returned to the church the following August, and during the small hours of the morning, we all observed a glow around the chancel door, as though a phosphorescent aura were being generated. This night, the ghost made its presence known by producing some more sounds, which ended with a very frightening grunt or sigh. as this sigh is repeated. In the quiet churchyard, apparitions and strange sounds are reported close to the graves of the Reverend Henry Bull, the builder of Bawley Rectory, and that of his son, Harry Bull, who followed his father and whose spirit apparently communicated with his sisters during the seance with Harry Price in the Blue Room. From time to time, people still claim to have captured evidence of the continuing haunting of Borley Rectory and the adjacent uh, Borley Church. One of perhaps the best known is the Brazil photograph, which was taken in 1972 and is sometimes described as the most important photograph to have ever appeared in relation to the Borley case. The photograph was one of a series taken in September of 72 by the investigator Eddie Brazil, who is still to this day considered to be a leading authority on the case. The day was overcast and the picture was taken around 2.35 in the afternoon. The most likely explanation is that the figure is nothing more than a blemish on the negative. An assessment by fellow investigator Paul Adams, however, argues that this picture is genuine. Adams said that Mr. Brazil was more than competent as a photographer and that such a blemish would not have gone unnoticed. Adams also suggested that the figure corresponded exactly with the proportions of an average human figure in the same standing in the same place and location the bottom half of which is hidden behind the fence following his further analysis adam said that the figure was suggestive of a human form standing side on to the camera and wearing robes the figure's head covered by either a hood or a veil the churchyard is visible through the semi-transparent figure. Periodically, visitors continue to share their own strange pictures taken in the churchyards and in the surroundings. People still report hearing horses' hooves in the roadway, galloping past the rectory site. And the ghostly nun is still occasionally reported leaning on the gate or wandering along the nun's walk, which still survives. On March the 29th, 1948, Harry Price died while seated in his study. He died almost instantly from a massive heart attack. For almost 25 years, he had suffered from severe heart condition yet he had refused to accept the limitations and constraints it imposed upon him. Harry had dedicated his life to psychical research and had tried again and again to find someone 
to take over his beloved laboratory and library. In that he failed, but he left us a lasting legacy. As for Borley, it continues to keep its secrets. Down the decades, there have been more than 25 books, almost as many documentaries, and even a number of movies that feature the site and its ghosts. Visiting almost every paranormal group's website will reveal at least a page or two about Borley. It even has its own game level in Sims 3. The mystery of Borley Rectory endures and it continues. Although the house was burnt to a, down by fire in 1939, ultimately demolished in 1944, during 2017, it arose from the ashes in the form of an exact 124th scale model. This model was built by my friend and model maker, very skilled model maker, Andrew Taylor, entirely out of paper and cardboard. And the model represents the most accurate model of the most haunted house in England that has been created to date, although... Unfortunately for me, he is working on an even more detailed model as we speak. The scale model even allows Borley to be investigated by modern generations of ghost hunters. There we go. That's it done. So if I stop sharing the screen... It, I designed, you know, I intended that this would end in a discussion and a bun fight. Um, so let's let's continue with the plan. Okay, okay. So the first the first question comment we've got is from Rob Gandhi. Question: Have you managed to sort out the files in your loft and found the papers relating to why people might hallucinate whilst driving in their cars? No. Okay, Rob. I hope that that was. Um, succinct no, enough for you. you. Saw, if you saw our attic, you would understand. Um, you, the you, classic you... case there is the claim made in 1981 in The Unexplained, edited by Peter Brooksmith, that there's a certain road north of Paris where there is an avenue of trees and they had to cut down some of the trees because as the setting sun came down, it caused a pattern of light and darkness that was stroboscopic when you drove through at a certain speed which would result in people crashing and it's in the it's in the article i'm slightly curious about it because as far as i can work out any avenue of trees if they are equally spaced would have that effect if that is possible as the sun goes down depending upon the speed at which you drove through so one avenue might be 33 miles per hour another might be 55 but they should all work like that but i assume you've done some work on this steve yeah um there was uh, what rob's referring to is is um there was a uh, it may even be linked to what you've just described but interestingly um i actually know someone who uh when the sun is in a certain position so certain months of the year um, yep. they they actually because they suffered an epileptic fit whilst a passenger in a vehicle caused by the the intermittent flashes and uh, of uh, the sunlight penetrating the the trees adjacent to the side of the road um and there are a couple of other people whose epilepsy is triggered um who I've spoken to and they also assert that um on certain roads, you know they can be driving along and or be being driven along be, because um in all cases these people are due to their epilepsy not allowed to drive um but have found themselves um being adversely affected by the flickering of the sunlight through the trees so there is I, there is there there does seem to be some substance to this I don't know if you've seen my Facebook today, but I talk about an episode of Photosensitive um, 
alteration in consciousness caused by traveling, by going to uh, the supermarket at Tesco here. But another way in which it can sometimes affect you is you living in West Wales, you won't experience this unless you drive early in the morning. But if you're driving back from Bury St Edmunds or anywhere in East Anglia towards Cheltenham or towards Wales on an evening in October or November or December, the sun is very low on the horizon. Um, and as you're driving into the sun, it can actually have really quite strange effects, mainly dazzling and causing you to crash. But also, you know, there are, for many people, photosensitive effects. I, I, I do find myself sort of dreading a morning drive home, um, you know, after a night event along the M4 and into of the... Of course, you do drive back that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, in the, if I decide to get out the evening before and I'm driving east along the M4, um, I'm driving the settings on, uh, both of which times I, I actively avoid, if possible, for the reasons you describe. It can be very disconcerting and tiring on the eyes, if nothing else. It's great when the song. Thank you very good. much. Thank you. Um, Steve Burrell's been an absolute star tonight. He's been putting in lots of links here for people who um, might want to have some of the, the books relating to this. So there's things like Prices, Cold Light, um, and there's there's all these different things. So if anybody wants to have a list of these books that you can have, um, I believe all of them are free downloads from what was saying. Steve's nodding his head there. So um, if you just bear with me, I will try to get those uploaded onto the Facebook site under Borley Rectory, unless Steve has them at hand and he can do that for us ourselves. I don't um, have, I mean, I've got the yeah. book in the hand, they're in the bookcase next to me, but... Uh, yeah. I don't have These are for people who can't afford £300, £3,000 per book or whatever they are. It is so, a bit um, for some of them. Um, but yeah. for those who are interested <laughs> in Borley itself... Um, there have been some modern reprints, although even they are starting to go up in price. Um, mm. but I, put, I put a couple of reprint um, onto the Facebook page a minute ago for them. And I think it's £11 for yeah. a book and 32 for the hardcover for Borley, The Most Haunted. So that's already uploaded for you guys. I mean, some of Price's uh, books, because they were published in and around the, um, the period of war austerity, the print runs were actually quite surprisingly small um and the paper they that they used was quite um thin by by comparison um because they had to you know adhere to wartime austerity or post war rationing austerity um and so they don't they don't survive often in fantastic condition um particularly the first book the most haunted house in england it's it's hard to find good copies and they they come at a premium um, as do many of Price's books. Uh, I think the one on um, Jeff the Mongoose is probably the possibly the most the most expensive. Although, um, huh. yeah, I think yeah, I think Jeff is still the most expensive. As Cal mm. keeps waving his copy all over social media, <laughs> making us all aware that he has a copy. Poltergeist over England is sometimes quite pricey. It might have been reprinted recently, though. Uh, Poltergeist over England. Um, I think the most. I think the most expensive I have is Tales from a Psychist's Casebook. Um, but they they bounce up and down in price. Sometimes you can see them. You know, really, there were there was a number of reprints down the years. Um, you know, there was a couple in the nineteen sixties. There was another couple in the nineteen eighties. Some of the books have never been reprinted. Um, but they are, in some cases, available on um, in PDF form or ebook form because they're out of copyright. Unfortunately, the early ones tend to have very inferior paper because of the paper shortages during the war. But um, there you go. I've got a question for you, Steve. I'm going to ask this now while we're talking about the books. Which book was published posthumously? Oh gosh, um, the the final one was, um, I think it was the end of Borley Rectory. Was that posthumous um, or not? I think that came very close to being, I think it was either just just before or just after his death. Um, the reason I'm asking is he was working on a third book, which is it? Ah, part right. That's what I was about to ask you about because 
There is a and Paul already have got three the manuscript version of I think it's three uh three uncompleted chapters. Right. The end of Burley Rectory was published in 1946. So that predates Price. So I, he was work, what was it? No, he was working on the third Borley book when he died. He definitely was because he wrote to there was a local history group in Bury St Edmunds, and they invited him to give a talk. And he agreed that he would in the future, when he was able to, give a talk with magic lantern slides. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was going to come and do a talk for them. But I think Philip Paul was a member of the group, which is one of the reasons why there's an interest in it. But he states mm -hmm. in his response to the secretary that he is working on a third book, which will clear up the mystery of Borley once and for all. There's no doubt he was working on the third book because we have some of the surviving chapters Um after his death, Peter Underwood and Paul Tabori, Underwood became Price's literary executor. Right. Um, and once they had finished writing their biography of Price, um, some of those books, papers, articles, ephemera um, have have been passed on. I, I, I Eddie Brazil and Paul um, Paul Adam. Uh, have got a number of items. Um, I've got via the Underwood connection, um, Harry's own copy of the Most Haunted House, hand annotated by him, together with some other. Um, bits so, what, what was the mystery that he was planning to put forward? What was the <laughs> revelation he was planning to put forward to justify the third book? Do you know, or does anyone know? Or... I don't think anybody knows. There's been a lot of speculation. What's what's um, if you if you read through um, the Harry Price archive at the University College London UCL in their library, they have the Harry Price archive uh, collection of letters, bills of sale. Um, I think there's even a bus ticket in there somewhere. Um, it 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 seems to be apparent that he w the theory he proposed or was proposed by Phys Phy Phythian Adams, Reverend Canon Phythian Adams, um, about the relating to the nun. I don't think Price was really um, a great believer in that. Um, but what the revelation was. We can only speculate, and many have. But on, on that regard, then I think it, you know, we might want to put these questions to Eddie or Paul, because um, both of whom are with us and both are very active. They maintain, Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, they're active on social media and much better place to answer those questions. Has Glanville's Lots book reemerged over the last decade or so? Who, sorry? Glanville, Sydney Glanville investigation. No, it's, it's, yeah, the, the missing, uh, the locked book was the diary and detailed accounts that were maintained by Price's assistant during Borley. Price, during that one year um, tenancy of Borley, Price actually only visited on an, a few num a few occasions because he was um, suffering ill health and busy on other projects. And he relied very much on um, Sidney Glanville, uh, Glanville's son, and Mark Kerr Pierce uh, to, in, in in effect, head and lead the investigation. Um, Glanville kept a very detailed um, record, which he called, which he kept in a book, which was which had a, a lock on it. It was called the locked book. Um, it eventually went into the um harry price library where later uh trevor hall claimed um to the curator um i can't remember his bloody name um that he had been promised access to the book um it was it was delivered to him and he never returned it and it was later sold to a private collector in America where it's supposed still to be, but nobody knows exactly uh, its whereabouts. There is a, there is a duplicate uh, or a copy of the contents of the locked book. Uh, so the, the information 
most of the information is available. But as to the the book itself, Trevor Hall made off with that and lined his pockets with it. Worth noting at this point that there are two other um, relevant talks here that are available on our YouTube channel. One of them is on the Ghost of the Leeds Library, which deals with Trevor Hall and his villainous activities. And I also talk about my experiences and relationship with Paul Lee on another one called Ghost of Paul Lee or some such, which is... He was an absolute, he was an absolute scurrilous character, Hall. Um, one of the one of the, the things that's always interested me is why he had such a why he led such a campaign against Price, um, which seemed to consume Hall for years, uh, and was you know very very unhel unhealthy, but has led to this idea uh, this 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 mud sticks. And many people, you know, they, they look at Price and they go, oh, yeah, but he was just an old charlatan and he was a fraud and his. Um, but this all this all really results from Hall's character assassination, which went on for, well, decades. Hall wrote a really unpleasant book on Price, yeah. but then compared with some of the books he wrote about the, some of the other founders of Psych yeah. Research, where he accuses them of all manner of things from paedophilia and homosexuality through to... He basically just made horrible accusations at anyone he could. And, he, he, I mean, interestingly, uh, I have um, a book on the shelf. It's actually Hall's book um, in which it's the Hall, uh, Kate Goldney, Eric Dingwall um, book, which was commissioned. The Hallley Report by the SBR mm -hmm. 1956, yeah. And um, I have Hall's copy. It has his book plate inside the front cover. One of the interesting allegations he made against Price was that Price had fraudulently claimed to be descended from an old Shropshire family. Yep. Um, and that he had given himself this lavish book plate with armorial arms. And Hall includes a, an illustration of one of Price's early book plates with the armorial arms. When one looks at Hall's book plate, it refers to a PhD that Hall never had. <laughs> and extensive checking afterwards, um, there is no uh, record of Hall ever obtaining or producing a PhD thesis or being given the, a... The talk on our channel is with the curator or chief librarian, one of the head librarians at the Leeds Library. Mm -hmm. uh, where Trevor Hall was working and where he's, you know, it's a private library in Leeds, England. And it is, apart from having a fascinating ghost story in it, it is a very, very, very uh, good look at what an unpleasant person Hall actually was. Well, I've got in, in amongst my price collection, um, I just wish I could remember his name. It begins with W, I'm sure. Uh, the curator of the Harry Price Library. Um, I have a, a number of letters in which he is describing and discussing Trevor Hall and describes him as the most odious character he has ever had the misfortune to meet. Odious, right. disreputable character that he had ever had the misfortune to meet. But okay. there we go. Next question. Sorry, we're rambling. <clears throat> okay. Don't worry. Rambling's good. It's good. Um, <laughs> Before we move on to the next question, Steve Burrell's been very patient. Um, he's raised his hand. Do you want to unmute yourself, Steve, and ask your question? Yes. Um, early in your presentation, Stephen, you mentioned this Cambridge group that was uh, sitting around discussing these things. And I'm uh, doing some work with Alfred North Whitehead, who came up with the cosmology that he claims was complete and adequate for every experience under the sun, essentially. And I cannot he imagine, since he was at Cambridge, and since he knew the Sidgwicks so well, and since he was a member of the Royal Society, I can simply not imagine that he completely avoided psychical research. I think he kept his nose very clean because he hoped to reform science. Uh, but I have been unable to locate any hint of a connection uh, with him and the SPR or any of the um, 
the um, actors involved, even to the extent I've postulated that Oliver Lo North, uh, I'm sorry, Oliver North, Oliver Lodge, when he lost his son, uh, Raymond, uh, a few, and wrote Raymond, of course, about the communications from his son, uh, Whitehead lost his youngest son in 1918 in the war. And of course, they were both involved in physics and they were both on dissertation committees and such. So they knew each other. And I just simply cannot imagine that Whitehead didn't sidle up to Lodge at some point and ask if he could fix him up with a good medium because Whitehead was despondent at the loss of his son, Eric. So I don't expect that anybody here knows offhand anything that might connect Whitehead with psychical research. But if there is anyone who does, please let me know. I would be tempted to direct you towards um, the archivist at the SPR. If you drop them an email, um, make it for the attention of the archivist. Um, there is the one person who I think may be able to answer your question. Well, okay. I've got... DJ, didn't yeah. we have Tony Hayes do a talk on Oliver Lodge on the webinar for us? Oliver Lodge? No, he, he wrote an article on Oliver Lodge, definitely. But what I have, I'm sure, I'm like, sure he did a webinar for us on Oliver Lodge as well. Possibly. He's re he's researched him, Steve. If you contact me afterwards, I'll put you in contact with Tony Hayes as well. Yeah. But on Whitehead, um, Alfred Whitehead, the philosopher, if he was a member of the SPR, we can just look through the lists because the mm. SPR would publish along with proceedings a occasional membership list, which includes everybody and. Uh, so if he was ever a member, it will be easy to discover. The other thing that you could try is the CUSPR would have records and they're kept. Uh, the archivist would definitely know. But the last thing you could do is you could, I don't know if you've tried the Cambridge um, undergraduate magazines and the Cambridge newspapers of the era. They might throw some more light on Whitehead's activities. And I would usually search via the home address, uh, but you could also search via the name using one of the British uh, newspaper searches. I'll do a quick quick search for you and see if I can find any links between Whitehead and psychical research later tonight. And if I can, I promise I'll immediately let you know and send copies across, okay? Yes, that'd be great. I did contact the SPR. Uh, with this question, of course, they had no record, and I asked it how I might get access to the their membership roles, and they they don't disclose that. But then I did discover that the proceedings for quite a while did publish their membership list, and so I'm I'm looking at uh, Whitehead's fan club, friends, family, associates, and neighbors to try to figure out if someone was perhaps had access to the journals that were that he could have at least read because he had to include psychical research in his in his um uh cosmology he, he only briefly mentions it twice and uh the first time in science in the modern world where he says there's not enough data to make any assumptions and then in um he does mention telepathy as a possibility in process and reality so um he was looking at it and I just will mention David Ray Griffin's last book. Uh, the title was something to the effect of uh, William James and Alfred North Whitehead. Did they believe in the afterlife? So uh, that might be something some it folks might be a reference to Whitehead in his love cycle research and the resur resurrection. I'll have a quick look tonight and just see if it refers to him. It might be. I mean. I'm trying to think through works that deal with the philosophical side. There's a lot of them, and I'm sure that people reference Whitehead's ideas, but I can't think off the top of my head. Anyway, let's get back to Bully and Steve, because otherwise we'll go down a very strange tangent. So. I've just got one other quick, and it is a tangent, but I just need to just know, let anybody know what I'm up to. I'll be going down to Barbados to examine the, the uh, Chase Vault. The Chase with, Vault. And the Chase Vault, the moving coffins. I'm sure you all know about that. Yeah. And um, and I'm going to uh, attempt to recreate the interior of the vault and the and the coffins just to determine if they could physically have moved from position A to position B, uh, because I've been in the crypt before and it's extremely tight. So I mean that would just be a question of um, that might determine 
if there was a hoax, although if two coffins dematerialized, perhaps they would have enough room to move the others around. That's really para paranormal. But if anyone has any information about uh, the, the, um, the the moving coffins, uh, I'd appreciate Claire it. Dabby's got, Claire Dabby has got um, did a talk on them. He went to, she visited the uh, Barbados uh, graves, graves. Who was that? Claire Dabby, she's the secretary of ASAP. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you go and have a look on um, YouTube, Steve, you'll find if you look into the webinars that we've done previously, the secretary, Claire Davey, um, she did a talk on the moving coffin. So that might help you with some information you've got there. But thank you very much for your comments then. Um, well, Steve. Uh, yeah, whilst we were talking, we... I, I just managed to disprove... Uh, um something Albert Einstein once famously said, and which I have a quote, which I've resorted to on a number of occasions. You don't have to remember anything. You just have to remember in which book on, on the bookshelf it is in. And while Steve was talking, I was hastily looking uh, for the book that contains the early history of the SPR um, and the details of, of the pre um, SPR Cambridge um, societies and you can't find the book. So in addition to knowing it's on the bookshelf, you've got to know in which book and where the bloody book is. So Einstein. Well, that works. might be another that might be another webinar for Jot, but um <laughs> obviously not. Jot, and, anyway, can you tell people that's gonna be watching this, Steve, and they think, oh great, I'm gonna go to Borley and I'm going to go to the Hamlet, have a look, have a church visit. Nigel Bundy has said something about them being unhappy i've been very fortunate because a um relative by marriage was an an inspector in the essex constabulary and around about god how many years ago must be nearly 15 years ago now um together with a dr kieran o'keefe and uh the inestimable richard felix we paid an extraordinary amount of money to rehome uh, for three, four nights, the occupants of the bungalow that stood closest to the rectory, um, which allowed us obviously to have access um, to the site. And um, the following year, we were there actually there that time over the 28th of July, uh, oh. the, the, uh, the the day on, upon which the nun is supposedly most likely to appear. Um, and on the following year, and indeed the year after that, um, we returned on the 28th of July um, and spent both nights as the guests of Essex Constabulary because the place at the time most haunted was, was on television. Uh, the little rectory... Um, was a very popular place it still is particularly around the 28th of july um the little name board uh name sign as you come up the lane from uh long melford um uh, was continually disappearing taken as a souvenir and so what happened was exit constabulary used to get a small porter cabin with a couple of um police officers and cite it in front of the church and would do their best to deter sightseers from the church grounds and the areas around the church legally there was not a lot they could do so they result they would often resort to wandering about with a speed gun um and trying to you know capture people going a little too fast or using any other trick that they could um, do um, to try and dissuade people from visiting because it it was I mean it is a tiny tiny little place. There are on there are two parts of the village, Bawley Green and Bawley Corner, yeah. effectively. And the, Bawley uh, has got about six residents, yeah. uh, six houses, yeah. three bungalows, a large house, a couple of sheds. And it is as it always has been a you know a very small little community probably smaler now than it was then 
as far back as 1985, um, one of the residents was annoyed enough to go out with a shotgun and let off the odd shot in the direction at Halloween of people who'd come up from London just to make a noise and run around the churchyard. You know, they go and fire warning shots and shout at them. If you... If you go to the, if you want to visit the church, they've made the parking now extraordinarily difficult. There used to be two parking spaces in front of the church, but I understand that they've now been or access. There is a chain across them. It's impossible to stop anywhere in the village. And the only realistic way now is to park down by Fox Earth at the bottom of the hill and walk for a mile and a half up from the bridge, across the bridge, and then up the hill. And you will find that when you get there, people are not instantly you know they're they're very wary of people um you know visiting the the hamlet um and during the visits that we were there over the 28th with the with the support of the constabulary courtesy of the family member um i think we earned their gratitude and assistance by lending them our thermal imaging camera uh, so that they could catch miscreants creeping across the fields trying to get in <laughs> it's a long way across the field it yep. is they they were they you know they they were um and on one one i think the last time i, I was there over the 28th of july the present incumbent who who lives at liston because liston and borley parishes were combined um visited to you know thank the the police and to keep an eye on his church and i had a conversation with the gentleman and he was not in any way open to any any questions or suggestions relating to even the accounts by Alfred Henning, who wrote a history of the church, a short pamphlet in which he he also talks about the ghosts. Um, the the incumbent, um, I think, put down was that um, there are no ghosts at Borley. The people in the lying consecrated ground and no spirits walk in the churchyard. He's he had, actually he, actively hostile to anyone who mentions anything. I mean, he may have they may have changed incumbents, as I say, it was about ten no, years. No, the, the sign is still on the porch door, Steve. Um, I've forgotten his name, but he's rector of Cavendish Liston and Baldy. He was not a helpful man at all. He's not at all. He really does not want anything to do with it. But then I, who can blame them? Who can blame them? Well, don't forget that as long as far back as the 30s, you've got accounts of, in fact, early 30s, there are parts in the Sudbury Free Press, which is their version of the Berry Free Press, about people complaining that there were sightseers driving up from London in motor cars to try and see the ghostly carriage at Ball. Not only that, um, I, I recall having a conversation with a 90-something-year-old lady um, just four or five years ago, So, but fortunately she's passed away now. Um, because as a youngster living in London, her parents took her on a Sharabang trip <laughs> to see the ghosts of Borley. And in the back garden, um, I think Captain Gregson may have been involved. Um, they'd set up um, uh, tents with serving tea and scones and, do was, and doing psychic readings. That was the post rectory uh, phase. They would do a ghost phase, and they did a, several of them going up as far as the 50s. My mother attended one of them, I think, which were held on the site until the bungalows were built. Uh, they were done as a sort of charitable thing by some of the Sudbury and Act and Act and Women's Auxiliaries, I believe. I've got some paper, I've got some flyers and things from a oh, lot of A lady generously gave me a flyer um, and yeah. the tickets that her parents had kept since her trip up there in 1947 wow 47 was it yeah i knew i knew it was my mother went so it had to have been after 31 she was 16 then. my grandmother her job was she was a my my ancestor is fleetwood cod which is a wonderful name but cod created um jokingly called cod's wallet by many a kind of lemonade that had a bottle that had a marble in the neck and my grandmother, as a minor member of the Bentley family, she would go out and do the deliveries. And she used to take the lemonades to Baldy, where she reported to me when I, whenever I mentioned it, she'd laugh about the Ball sisters and say, horrible old place, bad drains, no ghosts, stank. And that was it. That was her whole summary. She didn't believe in ghosts and it had bad drains. There you go. 
there is a there is an interesting uh, book that's never I don't think it's ever been published that's online um, by the Fox Earth Society, and it it, right. it it's um, several hundred pages long um, that details and debunks every aspect of the rectory and talks disparagingly about those that visited, including Price. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's ever been published though. Yes, I've never seen a published version. And of course, perhaps the bizarrest book of all was the book describing the aliens that had taken over Borley Rectory um, and were involved in whatever aliens do. Who was that? Um, it's still available on Amazon, if I can remember the title of the bloody thing. Um, Take the Ghost of Borley Rectory, written by the electrician from uh, Bedford. Well, there was, yeah, there was, yeah, was fake, yeah that was, that was, fake, it's a fake confession, which is hilarious. Yeah, but this other book was only, it's relatively recent, it's, it's a sort of 90s, early 2000s publication, um, and it, 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 the, it contains the revelation that there were no ghosts at Borley, merely aliens. So, oh, hang on a moment, is it? Hang on, I've got to try and grab this. About 2 99 I paid for mine on Amazon. I'm sure get booked out. Adventures. Book Rectory, the Ghosts That Never Were by John Peters. No, no. I, I haven't read that one yet. <laughs> there are so many. There are there just. Are, there are. I, I collect dodgy books, self published books on Borley. There is, um, if you bear with me, um, whilst, whilst we try and deal with the next question, I'll see if I can find the offending book on there was a new one that was released called the haunting of borley rectory by sean o'connor is that it uh, that's a that's a kind of very literary overview of the case by a chap who's done okay. some who writes about the ghost hunters as much as about the case it's a sort of yep. very literary worthy you know this kind of stand tendency for social historians bbc intellectuals and uh, academics from other fields to sort of decide that it's important to write a book about Nand or Fode or, who, or whoever <laughs> come in and write them. Like that. Okay. Um, while you're trying to find the details of that, um, Steve, please don't be offended with the snoring that you can hear. It's not me. Um, it's the dog. So don't <laughs> take any offence from that. It's The but Board it's... Of Incident by Terence Dix, published in 19... 19... Okay. Oh! Terence Dix, that's Doctor Who Dix, yeah, yeah, Damn and, it. It, and yep. it, is, it, it is, you know, it has the revelation of aliens inside. Oh him. yeah, he's that's Terence Dix who invented the dark. I can't say it. D a l e k s dialects. My yeah. Suffolk accent fails here. The dialects. Yeah. Dialects. It's his science fiction book, and it's a very rare and quite valuable if you've got a copy. Um, oh, it was only two ninety nine on Amazon a couple of years ago. Oh, it's been reprinted then because it was quite expensive. I shall it, go and dig my first out then. And... It is actually, you know, it's just it's a it's a it's a fun book. It's uh, it is, there is a um the title of it, of course, sort of suckers you in. Um, you know, oh, the Borley Rectory incident. Oh, it must be another book about Borley. I shall buy it. Alien. Not as bad as some of the films and so-called documentaries, which are just utter mm -hmm. bollocks. I mean, yeah. you know. Um, gentlemen, I am very conscious of the time. Um, can we just ask a few more questions because it's yeah, coming up to nine o'clock? Yeah. Um, so, Steve, when you played your um, sound recordings, did they have any, apart from talking, did you actually put the sound of the actual things that were supposed to be heard? They were included on those clips. A lot of us didn't hear them. Not the uh, uh, uh sound. There was big, huge gaps. So... Um, I don't know if you want to upload onto the Facebook group later the sounds. The thing, if people want to, um, you know, much quicker, because they are only extracts from the 30-minute original BBC recordings, um, mm. and they are freely available on YouTube. So if you go along to YouTube and uh, type in Borley Rectory uh, BBC, you will get the audio clips for yourself from there. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. I always, with the, with the noises... Um, and they say the grotesque moaning of the ghost. It always reminds me of the ghost doing something else. <laughs> I won't 
probe any more with that one, but thank you for that. Next um, question. Okay, so Bill said, for anybody who's interested, there is a copy of Price's book, Most Haunted House in England in the reference library. I think if you ask politely and you pay with um, a vat of gold, you can probably borrow that and hire it out from the ASAP library. I don't suppose um, any librarians from Bebbington Library back in the 1960s would be listening to this publication, uh, listening to this webinar. So I'm going to make a confession I've never made before. My first, I've got two copies of The Most Haunted House in England. The original came from the reference section of Higher Bebbington Public Library. When as a, when as a young eight-year-old, I borrowed it because you couldn't take reference books out. So you had to, and then kind of like, I couldn't find a way of safely returning a book that I shouldn't have had. I'm well, looking. I've been contacted earlier today by Bebbington Reference Library and they ah. forwarded on a receipt for ah. £1,027. So oh. I will forward that on to you for outstanding charges. You're welcome. What, what is more significant is that the end of Borley Rectory by Price is not only available in ASAP's Reference Library, but also in the Lending Library. So that one can be borrowed, the other one can't. I've got okay. a couple of copies here as well if anyone that will need to copy. I believe that there is um, also a plan by, I think it's White Crow, to pub republish both editions. It's already been published on Amazon. Has it, has it already come out? Yeah. Cool. I've put the links into the Facebook group for everybody. I'm advanced. Don't worry, I've done it all already for you. Um, okay, moving on, because we, we really are getting short of time. Um, Julie Elizabeth Boyd said... There's records of bats in the church. Could it be anything to do with their interference, maybe? Um, I, I don't think so. Bats tend to be ultrasonic. Um, and the sounds of the that are on the recording and the inter the the other don't seem to relate to, to bats or what bats do. Um and there are many no, I I, I don't think that bats would offer an explanation. Certainly not for some for the majority of the accounts. Okay. Um, there's another comment about um, the SPR having a section reference library reference Borley. So if anybody is a member of that, they could probably go to the SPR and able to take the book and read it oh, while they're in the library yeah, also. Well, if you are a member of the SPR, you can use yep. the lending library, uh, postal lending library, um, yep. free of charge. Thank you for that. Um, there's we have quite a few copies scattered around our libraries so excellent thank you um there's lots of thank yous for the talk riveting great talk thank you excellent great talk um i'm trying to find the next proper question jenny cadwell question <laughs> steve have you visited the site of the rectory yourself i think you answered that earlier i've as i said before i've had the privilege of staying there um on in a bungalow actually well that's how we got the bricks because whilst we were there, the owner of the bungalow was doing some extension work and had dug a series of trenches uh, adjacent to his house. And he actually uh, had hit the foundations of Borley Rectory. And myself, Dr. O'Keefe, Dr. Anne Winsper, um, all asked him terribly nicely if we could avail ourselves each of a brick. Um, so we knew with 100% certainty that they'd come from the rectory. We also had them check later that they were of the right type and era. Um, and when we, when we looked at the trench where the bricks had come from um, and over, you know, looked at modern plans versus the existing plans of where the rectory was, um, these were right on, from right underneath the dining room area very close to the area where the nun would peer through the window. Yeah, and they were definitely then from Baldy because the previous rectory is actually behind the site of the current one. So the foundations of that are further back. So yeah, it would be 100% from the haunted rectory, not the other one. I understand later, Dr. O'Keefe sold his brick um, and poor Richard Felix got half a brick. <laughs> It's even less now because he keeps crumbling bits off for other people. Well, we, well, Richard and we, we'd had a little bit of um, fun 
because we were there over the 28th. We were all on Most Haunted at the time. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of people walking about wearing Most Haunted T-shirts. And we were desperately trying to keep Richard and Kieran, especially um, from the view of the public, because in case they thought that, you know, perhaps Most Haunted were doing something there. Um, and Richard had made a, you know, we wanted we wanted to sort of get our own back so when we excavated the bricks um with the permit as i said with the permission of the the owner um there were three full bricks and a half brick and so thoroughly irritated on that occasion by richard we gave him the half brick <laughs> bless him he always gets done off doesn't he He's on right the Dave, david watts has said um do you think personally steve that it was haunted or not i think undoubtedly um if you if you look at the criteria by which we define a haunting which is you know repeated uh phenomena over years reported by multiple witnesses then it matches and exceeds all of the the criteria for it being a haunted building i think the quality of the price investigation was for its time exemplary um, and it still stands as a standard for uh, investigators. Uh, the blue book, the guidance notes that Harry produced for his investigation team and the directions he gave us, um, mean it it has survived, you know, all of these years as a landmark case, even if the building itself hasn't survived. Uh, as to, yes, it it more than exceeds the criteria by which we judge a building to be haunted great thank you um justin cow said how much of the original documentation related to witness statements and prices notes there is actually well if you go by the locked book which is glanville's um, records he had a substantial number of the original documents there's a there's a smattering of them in the harry price library which is a uh goldsmiths i think or ucl um some of them have gone into private ownership like for example um eddie and paul's uh chapters that went, that came down through the tabori um i've got a number of um others that came down the same route um so price's copy of the most haunted house some of the some of the plans that were used and um indeed the original postcard that was used as the illustration for the book um so unfortunately and you see this on ebay periodically um the the harry price archive has been some of it has been pre preserved a lot has been dispersed and has sort of found its way out onto ebay has found itself in private collections and one of the things I would love to see and would happily donate the ones I've got are them all being brought back together into a centralised record archive. Um, but at the moment, you know, they, they are well scattered. <laughs>